Well, good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, be invited to talk to you all. Um, I enjoyed very much uh, listening to Georg Fischer um, this morning, and it made me think about my career in economics. When I was a PhD student in the US in the 1980s, in the US there was already a well-established culture um, of looking at the impact of social programs. This culture goes back to the 1960s and the great society programs, the war on poverty. This was a period when the US government decided to spend an enormous additional amount of money on those types of social programs. And there was a real interest in learning um, what do these programs do? And that got academic researchers involved. It spurred a number of iconic uh, social experiments, the um, negative income tax experiments and the rent health insurance, insurance experiments, maybe ones you've heard of, but there were others. And there was sort of a back and forth between policy and academic research, and that helped moving the, the methods Forward. So that was the, the type of culture I grew up in academically and then after my PhD I returned to Germany and it was completely different. Um, in fact, uh, at the time, this was in the early 90s, there was a little scandal because one of the big German research institutes was uh, asked to prepare some policy evaluation reports for two different ministries around the same time period, the two ministries had asked basically the same question, but the research institute delivered two different answers that happened to coincide about with what the ministers were interested in hearing. And, you know, in a sense, I just think of this, it was systema uh, um, symptomatic of, of some of the culture at the time. I don't want to pick on anybody here, but in the past 20 years, um, observing what's been going on in Europe, it's really been a, a revolution in terms of um, how policymakers think about um, and are interested in learning which programs work. And then, um, as Georg Fischer said, in terms of academic research, how that has changed in Europe as well, and the, the capacity that has been, been built. So it's not that now we get everything right, um, it might still well be if two people do an impact evaluation of the same program, they may come up with opposite answers. But I think we're trying much harder, and uh, I think the, the heart is much more in the, in the right place. So in my talk today, I actually want to talk to you about, well, how do we know whether we got the right answers and uh, in econometrics, we think of this as doing robustness checks. So this is a, a project I've been working on with a former PhD student of mine, um, Hannes Schwant. Um, here is uh, sort of an example to motivate to you what uh, this is about. This is a study by Lalif and Zweimüller. They want to know what's the impact of uh, an extension of parental leave, parental leave duration on various outcomes. This is looking at whether families have additional children, sorry. And in very many studies, you will see something like this, that the researchers start with showing you some baseline results. This is basically a, a regression discontinuity design where they compare parents of children who were born in June and then on July 1st, the policy changed. So babies born after July 1st, um, their parents will be entitled to more parental leave. So that's the comparison. Um, the post-July born babies are the treatment group and families um, that get more parental leave have about 0.045 more children. Now, what they do, and what I'm sure many of you have done, I know I have done it in a lot of my work, then we run a different model, a different specification, where we include a number of controls. And there are actually more than the ones I'm showing you here. 
So these are variables about the previous employment status or unemployment of the parent. Um, they're entered in a regression. And we look at whether the coefficient of interest, the treatment effect, <coughs> changes. It here goes from 0.045 to 0.049. And if that change is not very big, then we declare victory. We say our results are robust. Um, and hopefully, this is more or less the right estimate. So we want to think about the process, what underlies this reasoning, what are we doing here, and is this the best way of, of checking for robustness? Um, when we do this comparison of different specifications where we enter additional control variables in a regression, um, typically, researchers just eyeball what happens to the coefficient, to the treatment effect they're interested in. There's no formal assessment whether the movement in the coefficient is big or small. Um, there's typically no formal testing. There's some theory underlying what we're doing here, even if we're not um, explicitly aware of that or make it uh, um, necessarily spell it out. You might know the paper by uh, Altonji, Elder, and Tabor. Um, and they think about the fact that as we enter these control variables that we might have available in our data, we think of these variables as capturing things that are very much like the other things which may still be omitted. So these observable variables um, might be very much like other unobservable variables that could also be confounders of the treatment effect we're interested in. And if the observables are like the unobservables, then this procedure makes sense. There's a recent paper by Emily Ost Oster um, of actually making very precise the, the relationship between observables and unobservables and exactly what you need to assume in order to point identify a treatment effect. <coughs> now, on the other hand, when we do randomized trials or when we look at regression discontinuity designs, researchers often don't do this, but instead they will show you balancing tests. They also use additional variables from their data set, but in a regression sense, they put these variables on the left-hand side and show you a regression of characteristics of treatment and control groups against the treatment and check whether the two groups are balanced. So this is another procedure, um, but very much related to the same type uh, of question, trying to check whether we think our results are going to be believable. So what do we do here? Um, first of all, we explicitly spell out what does this coefficient comparison that's often done um, uh, you know, in a very informal sense, what formally would that involve if we did an explicit statistical test? And we compare this test to the balancing procedure that's often done in the, you know, when you have a randomized experiment. And I'll spell out to you in a slide or two exactly how these two relate. We formulate this problem in terms of a single variable that you might want to add to a regression. So going back to the Laleaf and Zweimuller example, they actually have lots of variables here. I'm going to talk about a single one, and actually one of the the things that we haven't quite worked out yet is how to do this when you have many potential confounders um, because you, you, you will see why, um, why that is somewhat problematic for us. But gladly, focusing on a simple, single variable actually makes things simple and certainly for pedagogical purposes um, it, uh, it's a useful tool as well. The problem 
that we primarily address is thinking about these variables that we have available, the observables, that they may capture the type of concepts we're after. So, for example, people's attachment to the labor market, their actual employment or their unemployment experiences are probably pretty reasonable proxies of that. They may not be perfect, but often the variables we think are actually fairly imperfect. So we think of these, um, the variables that we have available as being measured with error. And in some sense, that's very similar to saying they're observables and unobservables. You can formulate the problem in the way Altanji, Elder, and Tabor did, or Oster did, or in the way we did. It's actually very closely related. We focus a lot on statistical inference and the power of statistical tests, and I'm gonna try to convince you that actually looking at the balancing is a useful thing to do, and it's not done that often in studies that are regression-based or dip in debt for IV. Um, there isn't really very much that we say that is in principle not known, and probably the closest predecessor to our study in terms of what we talk about is an old paper by Sri Grilichis um, in Econometrica in 1977 about the returns to education. And if you're a researcher who uses regression and you haven't done so, you should read this paper. It's a wonderful piece that tells you a lot of important things. So we're gonna show how measurement error in this control variable enters um, the estimates in the different procedures and the resulting test statistics. And I'm gonna show you that the balancing test has greater statistical power, meaning that you're more likely to reject um, that your specification is robust when it is indeed not. Um, I'll do that, I can show you theoretical results for the simplest case and then we have some simulations for more um, relevant and, and reasonable cases. The empirical example we think about and we use to illustrate this is the returns to schooling, but of course, this is something that works for any evaluation context, any um, treatment effect estimate that you might be interested in. So the type of framework we're thinking about is basically anything you can formulate as a regression. Um, and I'm gonna talk about this very simple regression where you um, run an outcome on a treatment variable S. I call it S because to us it's returns to schooling, but you could think of it as T, it's being in your program or not. Um, well, this is just a bivariate regression which is what you would do if you actually had a randomized trial. It could be anything. It could be a regression-based study where you claim to identifying a treatment effect comes from the fact that there are other covariates in your regression. In this case, you just think of the S variable as partialing out these other regressors. These other regressors could be fixed effects, so this could be a differences in differences model or it could be instrumental variables. In this case, the S would just be the fitted value from a first stage regression. Whenever you can formulate your problem in this way, what I'm gonna say more or less applies across a lot of uh, um, different methodologies. So I wanna compare this regression to a second regression where I enter my candidate confounder some characteristic of the treatment or control observations or some pretreatment outcome. Um, and I wanna see how this affects the treatment effect beta. So that's the one procedure. The second procedure is to take this variable X, the group characteristics or the individual characteristics and run a regression of X on the treatment. And again, the specification of this would be commensurate with what you have up, up here. So if there are other regressors, you can think of them being here as well. Now, 
Relating beta s, the short regression coefficient to beta, the long regression coefficient, um, is of course governed by the omitted variable bias formula. Beta s minus beta is equal to the coefficient gamma, the coefficient on the regressor you are adding, times the delta from exactly this balancing regression. Okay, so that tells you that looking at the balancing regression doesn't give you the complete answer to what happens to your coefficient movement. And in particular, if you're interested in whether beta s and beta are the same, nothing happens as you add additional control variables, you need either gamma to be zero or delta to be zero. So if we're focusing on the delta, on the question whether delta is zero, whether treatment and control groups are balanced, um, we're implicitly assuming that the gamma is non-zero. And that often, in many circumstances, seems like a reasonable starting point, um, even if you don't know what, what gamma is gonna be, um, the fact that the variables we're thinking about, that they actually affect outcomes that frequently might be very likely. If you think of this as a pretreatment outcome, it would be very obvious that it ought to be correlated with post-treatment outcome. So here are the two statistical tests that um, you ought to be thinking about. The test whether beta s is equal to beta, whether the two coefficients are the same, um, that's a comparison of regression coefficient across different specifications. And you may remember from your econometrics course that that's done in a Hausman test. Now, in this case, it's not a straight Hausman test because regression coefficients, um, as you add new regressors, the standard errors can either go up or down. So there is no efficiency ranking of the two regressions. Um, as you need for the straight Hausman test, so you need to use a general Hausman test, and that just means you need to think about the covariance between your two estimates, the estimate of beta s and the estimate of beta, because they're presumably gonna be highly correlated since these regressions are almost the same. Um, the balancing test, of course, tests whether delta equals zero, and as I pointed out already, the first hypothesis um, the coefficient comparison means that gamma delta ought to be zero, and that could be, be either because gamma is zero here, or delta is zero in the, uh, in the balancing regression. So we focus on thinking about this, and that means um, that implies the maintained assumption that the gamma is actually not zero. Now I want to think about our candidate regressor X to be measured with error. So M is a measurement error, which I'll just assume is classical here. So it's uncorrelated with X itself, and it's uncorrelated with other variables, in particular S, really my only other relevant variable that is here. Um, so the effective regressions that you're running with your observed data, which is the XM now, are these. The short regression doesn't change because it doesn't involve variable X. The long regression is different. Um, if XM is measured with error, your coefficient on the treatment effect beta will now be different from what it was before. And the balancing regression is also affected because XM is measured with error, but you can see already that in the balancing regression, the mismeasured variable X is on the left-hand side. The measurement error simply enters the residual, which now comprises these two terms. And in the classical measurement error case, you know, this is a residual indeed. So this regression doesn't change, it just becomes somewhat less precise because you have an additional variance component here. But in this case, if X is measured with error, gamma will actually be biased. And if gamma is biased, then beta will be biased as well. So 
throughout the talk, these three regressions and the coefficients beta s, beta, and uh, gamma, and delta, I'll need you to keep in mind. I'll try to show them you, to you occasionally again. Um, but it's somewhat important to remember what the different moving parts here are, particularly the, the gamma and, and delta, so you'll see what I'm talking about. So here's the bias in that long regression that includes the regressor, the mismeasured regressor x. Beta m, the, the bias beta is beta plus a term that looks like this. Lambda is the attenuation factor that's, that gives you the attenuation bias in a bivariate regression, which is not what we have here. Um, but that's probably the measure of measurement error you're most familiar with. So it's the, the variance in the, um, in the true variable divided by the total variance, truth plus measurement error, gives you the fraction of the signal. And R square is the, the R square from a regression on S on XM. So that's the reverse regression from the balancing one. Um, so that tells you something how correlated the two regressors in the long regression are. Um, gamma delta, of course, you will recognize is the omitted variables bias. And it turns out um, in this multivariate model, it turns out convenient to work in terms of this um, coefficient, which I call theta, which is just this bit. Theta turns out to be the variance of the measurement error compared to the total residual variance of the balancing regression, including the original residual u plus the measurement error. So if theta is large, there's a lot of measurement error. If theta is one, this is just the original omitted variables bias formula. You get all of the omitted variables bias. If theta is zero, you get no omitted variables bias and the long regression beta, um, well, that's for the long regression beta. Your estimated beta is the long regression beta. Um, and if theta is in between, you get something in between. And interestingly, the bias on the gamma coefficient is just one minus theta. Um, that's the relevant multivariate attenuation factor for the gamma, and that will be one minus theta. This object here will be smaller than lambda. That comes from the fact that the R square cannot be bigger than lambda. So this is a fraction. Um, and you can see that the bias that you get in, in beta and gamma is sort of an apportionment with a one minus theta fraction here and a theta fraction here going on the omitted variables bit. So here are the various regressions again and the various parameters. And remember, we want to compare running the long regression and comparing the long regression beta and the short regression beta to looking at the delta. Well, what happens in the first test, classical measurement error in X will bias beta M. It biases it towards the short regression beta, right, which is beta plus gamma delta. And it biases gamma M towards zero. That's just your standard attenuation. So the bias in the beta will mean that the coefficient comparison test there's a direct bias in the object the test is about. And in addition to that, there's a second source of loss of power, and that's the fact that measurement error introduces more variance. Um, the residual here is not the same residual as if you had the true data. Um, that will increase your standard errors and lower the power of your test. If you look at the second regression and the delta 
testing whether delta is zero is just a very simple t-test, nothing fancy here. And the only source of loss of power here is the fact that we have more noise, but the noise goes in the residual. So these two end up being really the same. And the fact that the coefficient comparison test has lower power comes from the bias here. So I'm afraid the slides are getting uglier and uglier for a few more of them. But I'll try to take you through the, the key points. Start with the balancing test with the delta coefficient. The key statistic for the delta is just coefficient divided by its standard error. We want to test whether the delta is zero. Um, with the mis mismeasured x, that test converges to something that has this form. Um, if you had the true data, it converges to something that has this form, and you can see it only differs by this attenuation factor that's related to the measurement error, the one minus theta. And that comes exactly from this additional variance source. Now compare this to the t-statistic on gamma. If you were to test whether the gamma in your long regression is zero, again, form the t-statistic, same procedure. Um, if you had the true data, this is what the test would converge to. But with the mismeasured x, you get something that looks somewhat different. And again, you have the one minus theta here, just like in the test for the delta. That comes from the fact that there's more noise that goes in your residual. But there's also this component here that wasn't there with the true data and that wasn't there in the test for delta. And that part comes from the bias in the coefficient from what's going on here. Okay, so both of these will mean that uh, the t-statistic is lower, so you're less likely to reject if the gamma was truly significant. Now this one, the coefficient comparison test, unfortunately, is yet even uglier. But if you followed the basics so far, it's actually not that bad because it's really the same bits reappearing again. You can formulate this test um, as a t-statistic as well. You're just testing a single hypothesis whether the two betas are the same. So here's your coefficient and this is the standard error of this difference in the betas and it involves the variances of the beta estimates and it involves the covariance. And notice that um, we derived before that this difference is delta gamma times one minus theta. I'm gonna replace this on top. And in the bottom here, what I have here are three terms. And these three terms, if you look at the, at the bottom line, you will recognize from the previous slide. Um, if you set the, if you take the delta, Forget the gamma for a second. Suppose there was no gamma. You only had the delta bit. You'd only have this bit of the test statistic, right? The, oops, wrong way. The delta cancels and you're left, you're left with this. Am I showing you the right one? No, it's this bit. Right? That is the balancing test. Now this here is the second bit. If there was no delta, your test statistic would be this. It's exactly the t-test for whether the gamma is zero. So it turns out that the coefficient comparison test, the test statistic for that, is a combination of 
what's going on in the balancing test and what's going on if you were to test whether the added regressor is significant in your outcome regression that you're interested in. Okay, so the additional, the, the source of bias that we had here for the gamma carries over to the coefficient comparison. Because if the gamma is attenuated, then whatever variation in the x that you're not capturing that's correlated with your treatment will show up in your beta estimates. That's the intuition. Now, once you have these formulas, so what this tells you is that your test statistic is smaller than it ought to be or would be if you had the true data. So you're less likely to reject if these coefficients were truly different or the true betas, not the beta m. Um, so your test loses power. So the next step we do here is we derive the actual power functions for these tests. Power functions are the probabilities of rejecting if your null hypothesis is actually false. They are functions of uh, parameter d, that's the value the delta can take on under the alternative. Under the, under the null, delta would be zero. Under the alternative, delta could be anything, and depending on what it is. The power will, the rejection probabilities will be different. And uh, it's a simple t-test. We compare the t to a standard normal distribution. This is the standard normal distribution function. 5% test, that's the critical value. And the test statistic goes in here. And the power is a function of the value d. So that's the balancing test. That's the coefficient comparison test. And I can formulate these tests to look the same and just have different things in the denominator here. This is the, um, the balancing test rewritten in a form that it mimics, sorry, it mimics this one. And I really only have these two bits, the V delta or V beta, that are different. These are the variance terms in the denominator of the test statistic. You looked at this big ugly one and comparing it to the one that's relevant for the, delta, uh, for the balancing test, the V delta, the V delta is just one this part of the big expression here. So the coefficient comparison test has more positive terms, it has more variance, less precise, and therefore will have less power. Now, you can't see this from the formulas, but when we've played around with this, and I'll show you some power functions in a second, it turns out that most of the loss in power seems to come from measurement error. The measurement error is captured primarily by this term here. You see the theta um, in here. This is the term that's due to the bias in the coefficients that's introduced. There's obviously also the one minus theta out here, but that seems to play less of a role. Okay, even if the measurement error was not there, set the theta to zero, this would go away you still have this second term here in the coefficient comparison test. That's also a source of loss of power compared to the uh, balancing test. And that simply comes from the fact that if you do the balancing test, you're only looking at delta, and you're assuming that gamma is non-zero. Remember, that was my main assumption. This control variable you have available you believe is correlated with outcome. So that assumption, that implicit assumption, helps you, right? It gives you some statistical power. While here, we're relaxing this, we're implicitly testing whether the gamma is, uh, is positive or not as well. So you may want to keep this in mind. This is really the interesting part, and I'm going to show you that this is driving most results. 
So here I'm going to show you some simulations or some theoretical power functions to start. I need parameters for these. I've picked parameters um, so that the outcome regressions resemble the type of regressions we often see in micro econometric studies. Um, this panel here shows you implied R squares for the regressions of interest, which would be this regression here, including your candidate control X. And you can see that uh, they range from 12% to 68% here over the range of values I'm going to show you. I'm going to talk about a fair amount of measurement error. The lambda, remember, is the, the reliability ratio. So 0.5 means half of the variance in X is noise. 0.25 means a, um, three quarters of the variance in X is noise. So that's a pretty large amount of measurement error. But often, I like to think of these variables as really being somewhat poor proxies of the concepts you're truly after. Okay, so here are some nice colored graphs. These are the power functions. On the x-axis, you have the value of delta. If delta is zero, of course, you don't reject. That's your null hypothesis. So you should get uh, rejection probabilities of 5% for a 5% test. That's just type one error. Um, and then as D goes up, the power of these tests increases, you're more likely to reject. And uh, if there's no measurement error, that's the black lines, power goes up reasonably quickly for my parameters. For deltas um, close to one, you basically reject all the time your test has enough power. So this, this is nice. And you see here the balancing test, which is the solid line, and the coefficient comparison test, which is the broken line, they're almost on top of each other. You see that the balancing test has slightly higher power, but it's not a big difference. And that's what I just talked about, that you gain something from this implicit assumption that uh, the gamma is non-zero, but otherwise there's really not much. Now the blue and the red, they're the ones that introduce measurement error. And now you see bigger gaps opening up between the two test statistics. And particularly if the measurement error is big, so your x variable is really a pretty poor proxy, um, the tests are quite different. And in fact, the coefficient comparison test here never reaches power of 100%. The, the balancing test, of course, is affected as well. You know, power is less than if there was no measurement error, but still your power curve goes up and seems to asymptote to one. So it doesn't quite get there, even for a, a value of D of two. Okay, so that's basically the main message of the talk. Now we do this for some different cases. This is just homoscedasticity and your plain vanilla old style standard errors that nobody uses anymore today. Um, you think there's heteroscedasticity and you want to use robust standard errors. I'm not going to take you through the exact parameterizations we use. But these are the power functions with uh, robust standard errors. I haven't derived this, so we just simulate data and show you the simulation results. The black lines are the theoretical power functions for the homoscedastic case again. The blue lines are the robust standard errors um, and no measurement error. And you see there's a bit of a loss in power, but it's not great. And the two tests are very similar. But again, with measurement error, that's the red lines, you see big gaps between the two tests opening up. So the basic result goes through. Now again, classical measurement error in a variable <laughs> is probably not all that interesting. And very often measurement error will be related to some of the variables that we're dealing with. 
So a particularly interesting case is mean reverting measurement error where the m is actually correlated with the variable x and the parameter here, the kappa, is negative. So we know, for example, when people report incomes, people with high incomes tend to underreport. People with low incomes tend to overreport. Um, we also know that every binary variable can only have mean reverting measurement error, measurement error that's correlated with the truth because the variable only takes on two values. Um, if it's one, the measurement error can only have been positive. If it's zero, the measurement error can only have been negative, not the other way around. So this is a pretty important case. And again, you see the same result. Once you have measurement error, you see the same gaps between the tests. Um, there are many more scenarios in principle we could explore, but my sense is that this result is pretty robust. Okay? So the upshot from this is that when you do impact evaluations and you run regressions of the form as they do in the Lalif and Zweimüller paper, um, rather than putting your controls that you want to test on the right-hand side, put them on the left-hand side, run the balancing re regression, and report that result to me. That may often give you more powerful results. Um, I should stop in a, in a couple of minutes. I'll just show you very quickly in our empirical example that that indeed happens. Um, I'm not going to tell you great details about this, but uh, take this for example. This is a returns to schooling regression. So it's uh, earnings on years of education. There's a control for ability here, a test score. This is basically the, the data that Drillick has used in this 1977 paper. Um, it's the same data David Card used for returns to schooling paper as well. Um, you find about a 6% return to schooling. And the variables we're interested in, in seeing whether they matter are mother's years of education and whether the household had a library card when the individual in question was growing up. So these are variables about family background. But family background influences can take many forms. And we certainly don't think that mother's years of education or whether you had a library card, which is just a dummy variable, capture everything. So these variables are probably pretty poor proxies. And hence, in my scenario, I think of this as variables with a lot of measurement error. If you do the coefficient comparison test, you see coefficients here moving slightly, but really not very much. You don't reject. Um, your p-values, particularly for the library card, are pretty, pretty high. Library card actually isn't significant in that regression either. But remember, measurement error will tend to bias this coefficient down. If you put these variables on the left-hand side, you run them on schooling, and of course, the ability test score that you have in your regression here, you test whether years of education matter, so you test for evidence of selection. Are the more or less schooled, do they look the same? No, they don't. The more schooled have more schooled mothers, and the more schooled tend to come from households that were more likely to have library cards. And these tests both reject with p-values that are quite different from the ones here. OK? So this example demonstrates that in practice, you can get big differences. Now, to close, let me just remind, me, remind you that, of course, this is not a solution to all problems in assessing evaluation studies or studies of causal effects. It is one particular issue. It's how do we go about robustness testing and how do we go about it in particular if the variables we have available we think are poor proxies. That's the issue we wanted to address. I'm trying to point you in a direction that I think we've not seen done enough in applied work. Um, it doesn't solve all your problems. Um, 
if your results come out clean, that by itself doesn't mean your results are necessarily the truth. There are many open issues, or at least some open issues, that we haven't really addressed. Um, in particular, we haven't really any good thoughts on what you do if you, the controls you want to add in your specification check are many. For example, you have a dip and diff model and you want to introduce state-specific or unit-specific trends. There may be many of those. Um, there isn't really an obvious way of how to run balancing regressions in that case. And maybe in this test, the coefficient, in this case, the coefficient comparison test is actually the, the most efficient thing to do, but I don't know exactly what the answer is.